like maybe yell at them as they came in the pen. Just what if? To like have a meeting or. What if along the lines of like, rather than sharing like a time clock report every day? Awesome. So, Josh, tell me a little bit about this Netflix project of yours. It sounds incredible. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, it's it's definitely um, a story that interests me. I think for a lot of people, The Son of Sam is is such uh, an emblematic, you know, case back from the 1970s. Anybody who grew up in New York at the time always remembers The Son of Sam and the fear that was spread. Um, I, of course, knew it well. I was always interested in it, but then I was making another film of mine called Cropsy, and the detectives kept hinting that there was something going on behind the Son of Sam case that I should look into. Uh, and that they they basically told me that I should look up, get the book called Ultimate Evil and look up a guy named Maury Terry. And so I read this book called The Ultimate Evil and it scared the shit out of me. And I don't scare easy. So, you know, that led me to Maury Terry and that led me to this story of the ultimate evil and whether Berkowitz was a lone gunman. And I'll be honest, I'm much more of a skeptic. I like to debunk urban legends and, and things like that. So Maury Terry technically wasn't really like a guy who I would you know, hang out with because he was kind of more conspiratorial. But suddenly I realized, oh, there's such a fascinating story here about a guy who believed he had the keys to unlocking one of the greatest mysteries, true crimes of all time, but no one would believe him. But what if he was right? Exactly. You know, so it was kind of, it was really kind of cool. And then suddenly it became, you know, I, I don't, for better or worse, I can't really say that I, um, I kind of live being a filmmaker, being a documentarian, being a true crime person, if you've seen my work and <laughs> everything I do. So uh, it, it became one of my obsessions in a way. I tried not to fall into the, tr the rabbit hole that Maury Terry fell into, but in some ways it's nearly impossible. Exactly. And my parents actually were in New York during the whole Summer of Sam stuff. It was crazy. They even, my mom was actually telling me not too long ago, she remembers when he was caught and the bar she was at gave everybody free drinks and stuff like that. And everyone was celebrating and she remembers how scary it was because she lived like not too far from where everything was happening. So huh. scary stuff. Yeah, T totally. Now, I, you should ask her, like people tell me it was like the pandemic and I'm like, mm, are you really just saying that because, you know, everything's like the pandemic, like that's what we do or was it really like that was people so afraid that they didn't go out you know did it have that kind of cultural effect i'd like to know well she was saying that like there were times she had to go out wearing a different colored wig because you know he was going after brunettes and she had brown hair at the time i remember her saying that i remember her saying that yeah they had to be really careful and how scary it was i'll definitely have to ask her if it was like the pandemic though it's it's crazy because it sounds like a movie you know, it's like, is, and so I wonder, is like, is this where a lot of those movie tropes came from, from the Son of Sam case? Because you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Like the serial killer is sending letters into the press and the way that these letters sound like, well, hello from the gutters of New York City. I mean, you know, how many punk bands are gonna be created from that? You know, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> yes, exactly. And what were some challenges about making this? Well, one of the biggest challenges was the fact that, you know, you're dealing with a case that's over 40 years old. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of people are, are, have passed away, uh, but that also makes it far more interesting to kind of really get in there and get their stories. We, for example, got and, and show some footage that nobody's ever seen before from the 1970s. The footage is unbelievable. And tragically, people were telling us like, oh, you're the last person who's ever gonna get this footage because we're throwing it all away. And I'm like, what, you're throwing this unbelievable 1970s New York City footage away? How can you do that? Um, so it was, it was challenging, but I, it's such a fascinating time, whether it's disco, whether it's the clothes, whether it's the attitudes, whether it was the people. And so really getting in there and kind of uncovering the story uh, was challenging, but also fun. It sounds incredible, but yeah. And what's your favorite part about filming this? 
I have to say my favorite part is weeding through some of what we tried to do was not just to show the investigation, but to show a lot of how the press handled this investigation. And one of the ways that you could do that is to get the raw footage of how the press, the press coverage. And when you get the raw footage, you see what happens before and after. And there you hear people yelling and screaming and the conversations that they're having. And you see some of that. So it's like, it's, it's about what happens before you roll. And that's where you can really get the, the cool coverage. You're like, no, 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 go over here, get this part. Or like, oh, that, that, you know, that son of a bitch, they wouldn't let us get the pictures. You know? So it was really interesting to retell a story through raw footage, through press footage. Now, did you talk to any press people that were part of it? You did, what was, yeah, yeah, you talk yeah. about? What was it like you know, having them remember everything? Uh, it was it was kind of cool. It was interesting. You know, memory is a tricky thing, and I think very much now in 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 the world of true crime, as more and more people talk about old cases, we all understand the fallibility of memory, and and I think that's that's important here. Um, so it was just fun to talk to all the old press pe all the people back back in the day, and to hear their perspective whether or not they thought Berkowitz really did act alone. Um, I had heard that there was a lot of rumors going around uh, among people saying, hmm, we're not quite sure, but it was really interesting to dig in and to speak to these people and to find out. Also, I mean, Maury Terry gave me an unbelievable amount of files. And so digging through those files and reconstructing Maury Terry's investigation with an unbelievable amount of material was also very interesting. It's, you, you get to play detective, but you're playing a detective looking at a case that's 40 years old. And I think this is so good to have out now because so many people are obsessed with true crime, so. Yes, of course. Now, what's interesting is, is that Maury Terry's story, I think is a, in a lot of ways, a cautionary tale of true crime. Um, it's about, falling too far down the rabbit hole, which is both fun and alluring, but also dangerous. Um, you know, imagine if you will, you know, you look on a story on the internet and suddenly it's four hours later and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that was four hours went like that. Well, imagine if that, ha imagine that happening to somebody for 40 years. And that's what happened to Maury Terry. Um, he went down a rabbit hole and I don't think he ever got back out. I think so too. Yeah, that's interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. Wow. And are you planning on doing any more specials like this covering any other cases? Well, we did the Long Island serial killer uh, previously. I've done that case. Uh, we're going to have a podcast coming out uh, that covers uh, uh, almost like layer two. So Maury Terry's investigation was 40 years long. Um, there's only so much I'm going to get in four hours. Yes, of exactly. a 40 year investigation. So thankfully, we're going to have another layer. Um, and we only ironically, we only scratched the surface of the madness of this story. I am so excited to see this, see the podcast. I am so excited. And I can't wait to see what other cases you do in the future. Yes. Uh, and then after this, we have a, a movie coming out about a whale called The Loneliest Whale, um, oh. where we actually go on a search for a whale that calls out at a frequency that no other whale can hear. So that should be coming out later in the summer. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for you. And if you could cover one true crime case in the um, that you've um, heard of, which one would you want to cover and why? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the Eton Pates case. Okay, okay. E Eton Pates was one of the first kids ever um, on a milk carton, disappeared from New York City in 1978. Uh, I think it's a super fascinating case. I think um, I'd like to delve into the whole stranger danger mythology um, that happened uh, and just that whole kind of milieu for anybody who grew up uh, in the 80s, 
you know, missing children was it, uh, you know, Adam Walsh and, and Etan Pates and all those stories. And so to me, that's super fascinating. There's not just the investigation itself, but all the subtext around the investigation. Oh, I am so here for it. I, I'm an 80s kid. I was born in 83. And mm -hmm. yes, I, I'm here for it. I remember all that stuff. I remember Stranger Danger and yep. them taking our pictures, you know, just in case something happened and all that jazz. So. But, but of course, you know, the irony there is that stranger, strangers are like 0.01% of all missing children. You know, it's like, it's really parental abductions and like familial abductions, like people, you know, your family. And so, but like all this panic, much like satanic panic, you know, for me, which was also like incredible. There was so much panic about um, those cases, uh, but a lot of it was misguided, you know, of course not taking away from the tragedy of, of those missing child cases and how horrific it is when it is a stranger, but there was a lot of misguided, um, fear, you know, if we were statistically to look at where, where it was really happening. Exactly. And I have only time for one more question. Where can we follow you on social media so we can see all your wonderful work you've done? Oh, yes. You can see me, of course, a uh, big Twitter presence at Josh Zeman, um, J-O-S-H-Z-E-M-A-N. Uh, that you can catch me all around there. Lovely. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I had a blast with you and I can't wait to talk to you again in the future. Thanks, Amy. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.